Abraham. So we've been in a series called Jesus Is, and Jesus is greater than many Old Testament characters that we've been looking at. Um, And today we're going to look at another one who happens to be one of my favorite Old Testament Bible characters, um, and his name is Jacob. And the reason I think I relate to him so much is because I see a lot of myself in Jacob. Um, He was always trying to get ahead. He was always, he was a heel grabber, always trying to get the advantage. And Um, We're going to talk about him this morning and how Jesus is the greater Jacob, and we will come to that conclusion. But as we get started, I want to ask you a question. So listen very closely to this. How's your soul? How's your soul doing? Like, no, really. Like, how is your soul doing? Man, the past two or three years, three plus years have been crazy, if you think about it. Uh, No one else has lived in a three-year period like we had Um, all the way from COVID to health issues you might have had, to financial issues you might have had, to relationship issues you might have had, to all this outside stuff affecting your life. But I wonder if you've ever gotten to the point recently where you've evaluated your soul. How's it doing? Is it healthy? You see, often in our attempts to gain things, to gain status, to gain importance, to find success in life, we end up trading our souls for it. Um, And Mark chapter 8, verse 36 is just the verse I want to launch us off with this morning. It says this, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And my fear is that some of us in this room or myself or my kids or the kids in this room, the young people in this room, you're going to do great. You're going to have a successful life, but you're going to lose your soul at the end of it. And I don't want that to happen. And that could have happened to Jacob very easily, and we're going to talk about that. But I read recently that last year, more people died from taking selfies than shark attacks. So more people died in their attempt to take a selfie than people died from shark attacks. Uh, 78% of all images that are shared on Snapchat are selfies, are pictures of themselves. Uh, They say a thousand selfies are posted to Instagram every five seconds. Not just pictures, selfies. Uh, There are 93 million selfies taken each day in America, which would represent 2,583, 333 rolls of film. That's how much that would And then 19 out of 20 American teenagers have taken a selfie in their lifetime. That's what they say. And the reason I bring up a selfie is because we use a selfie to try to take a picture with the correct angle and the correct filter and the correct lighting to make us appear good. Like, don't act like you haven't done this. A lot of us have done this, where you want the right angle so that you can post it and it's going to look just great. Smooth out the skin, make things look better than they actually are. Make us look the best we can. Now, I am not on a campaign to get you to stop posting selfies or to stop posting pictures of your cats or anything like that, I promise. I just want us to understand that represented in a selfie is the struggle of who we really are and who we want people to think we are, right? Like you've been there. We want people to think we're better and more successful and have achieved more than we actually have. That's Jacob. And so I want to talk about this struggle through the lens of a guy named Jacob, Because no one in Scripture shows us more about the inner struggle of being true to ourselves and true to what God wants us to be than Jacob does. He lets us see all the ugly details of his life to find out who he really was. And I chose Jacob because he's complicated, like you are complicated and like I am complicated. 
I chose Jacob because he's complicated just like your husband is complicated. And just like your spouse, your wife is complicated. Just like your children are complicated. Just like your mother-in-law is complicated. Jacob is complicated. We can all relate to that. And there are many people from Scripture that I could have chosen to talk about when it comes to a complicated life. Um, Several that I could have chosen. I could have chosen Noah, right? Like Noah trusted God every day, year in and year out for many years. But then he messed up royally at the end of it by doing something very bad with family members. That's complicated. Noah is a complicated guy. Uh, We've already talked about Moses in this series. I could have chose Moses because he was complicated, His anger would get the best of him sometimes. He even murdered a guy. He made some very questionable decisions. He was complicated in many, many ways. Uh, Could have chose David. We've talked about David in the series already. Man, here's a guy who murdered somebody so that he could cover up the affair he had with this person's wife and then had the husband murdered to cover up his terrible decision. David is complicated. We could go to the New Testament and we could chose Peter. Peter was a very complicated guy, had a hard time keeping his mouth shut. Can you relate to that? That was Peter, Uh, the guy who got so mad and so defensive at one point, he chopped off someone's ear. The guy who denied even being a follower of Jesus, Peter, very complicated. And I tell you all these because the Bible is full of complicated people. Uh, You may have never chopped someone's ear off, or maybe you have. But please know that if your life and your story is complicated, then you are in very good company. I hope and I pray that you will never feel the pressure at this church to have all of your life together before you're here, before you're one of us, before you're accepted, because none of us have it all together. God is doing a work in our lives. God knows your complications. So I thought it would be most helpful to enter into someone's conflict in the Bible this guy named Jacob, and find ourselves in this story. Because we're in this story, and I believe you will find yourself. So we're going to begin reading in Genesis 32, starting in verse number 22. And we're going to read different sections of Genesis as we go here. So the words will be on the screen, but if you want to turn there, feel free to do that as well. So starting in Genesis chapter 32, verse number 22 says this. The same night he arose and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to them, said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. He's in a wrestling match all night long. So this is a pretty crazy time in the life of Jacob. We just glanced in, and what we glanced at, he's wrestling with somebody. That's the first thing we are reading about him this morning. It's pretty complicated reading about a guy who's in the middle of a wrestling match. And here's what we're going to do for the next few minutes. We're going to go back to the very beginning of his life. And I mean the very, very beginning, where he's not even out of his mother's womb yet. His mother is still pregnant with him. And then we're going to work forward to the point we just read where he's wrestling. And the reason I wanted to start here, though, at the wrestling, is because I wanted to show you that this is not the first time Jacob was engaged in a wrestling match. If we go all the way back to the beginning, to the very beginning of his life, he was already up to no good. And so if you're here, and if you feel like you have fought and clawed to get ahead, to get to where you are today. Like it has been a struggle and you have grabbed at heels and you have fought just to survive, then you're going to learn from Jacob today. You're going to get something good for him. Because at the very beginning of his life, he was already up to no good. If we go back to Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse number 21, 
Here's what it says about Jacob. And Isaac, that's his father, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. So just imagine the sonogram. Okay, the nurse is probably freaking out, says something like, first of all, you're having twins. Second of all, they're already fighting. Like they're not even out of the womb yet, and they're already fighting. This is sibling rivalry on the next level, fighting in the womb. And Jacob's mom says what I think every mom has said at some point in their life when raising kids. She literally says to God, why is this happening to me? You've been there, mom. You know what that's like. Why is this happening to me? And I like that because sometimes it's a good idea to just go straight to God about our problems. It doesn't say she went to all her friends. She went to her family. She went to relatives. It says she went to God and said, why is this happening to me? So she goes to God. And she has these two sons. And the names they come up with are pretty creative. So the first one is named Esau. And Esau simply means hairy. Like, real creative, just named them what they saw. Okay, you came out, you're hairy. We're going to name you Esau, which means hairy. And then the second born, they named Jacob, which means heel grabber. Because he's literally grabbing the heel of his older brother as he's being born. They named them both something that would define them for a very long time. As you can see, Jacob was born trying to get ahead, grabbing at heels. And I should explain to you why he might have been doing that. You see, to be the firstborn in this culture meant you had all the privileges, most of the privileges. The vast majority of the inheritance would be yours. The spiritual heritage would be yours. And that was a big deal back then. Now, I don't think Jacob knew this in the womb, obviously. I just think there was something instinctual about this. You see, no wonder Jacob was born trying to get ahead. Something instinctively inside of him says, get ahead. And I don't know if you can relate to that or not, but I can. I can relate to that instinctual side, the part of me that just says, keep getting ahead, keep striving. You see, he was born with this me first mentality. If I could just have been born two minutes sooner, then I would have been the firstborn. Then I would have had the spiritual rights. Then I would have had the blessings. I would have gotten more than you if I could have been born first. That's Jacob's life. And for all of you who don't believe this idea that we are all born little sinners, all that does is tell me is that you haven't had children yet. Because trust me, this me first mentality, you don't have to teach kids to say me. They will figure that out by themselves. You don't have to teach kids to say no. They will figure that out by themselves. You do have to teach them to say please to say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, you don't have to. We all start with this me first mentality. Jacob's problem was he never outgrew this. There was a time, even in Jacob's life, where it was probably cute. Uh, but when you're a grown man still worried about your birth order, then something has gone wrong. You see, if you live in a way where everything has to be about you, and everything people do is an offense to you. If your ego has to be involved in everything that happens, whether it's at work or with your family or with your friends, it's exhausting. And I'm saying this because I'm speaking from experience. What I've realized is that me first is miserable. It's a miserable way to live. So let's fast forward through Jacob's life to when he and Esau are now men. They're older now. You see, what happens is one of them is an outdoorsman, Esau. He's a hunter. But the other is kind of a stay-at-home person. This is Jacob. One is good at hunting and trapping. 
The other is good, Jacob, at cooking. Uh, One is his dad's favorite, Esau. The other is his mama's favorite, Jacob. One can skin a deer. The other can cook a meal. There is a big difference between these two brothers, Jacob and Esau. So one day, Esau comes in from hunting, and he's starving. I don't know how long he was hunting. I don't know that story. But he comes in, and he's starving. And the stew that is being made is just very, very appealing to him in that moment. So he tells Jacob, Jacob, give me some stew. Give me some of it. But Jacob, being Jacob, says, give me your birthright, and I'll give you some stew. And it's yours. So for some reason, Esau agrees to this. He sells his birthright as firstborn to Jacob for a bowl of stew. And just like that, Jacob gets the rights of the firstborn. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for Jacob. Jacob wanted and needed his dad's blessing on his life. So it couldn't just be that. It also had to be the blessing. And this is a very important ritual that had to take place. You see, what's happening here is that Jacob needed more. He needed more. And when you're centered on yourself, it's never enough. When you have this me first mentality, when we have the clutching of the heels mentality, you always need more. In fact, C.S. Lewis said this about our possessions. He said, we don't actually take pride in the possession itself, but in having more of it than someone else. It's so true, isn't it? It's not necessarily the possession itself, but the fact that I have more of it than you do that makes me feel good. This was Jacob. So then what happens is it's not enough just to have a nice house. You need a nicer house. It's not enough just to be thin. You have to be thinner than other people. It's not enough just to be rich. You now have to be richer than other people. My kids can't just be smart. They have to be smarter than other kids. And when we live with that mentality, we are well on our way to gaining the world but losing our soul. You see, and since it wasn't enough to just have the birthright, Jacob needed more. In Genesis chapter 27, as we're moving along here, we find this crazy story of Isaac, their father, being on his deathbed. So he tells Esau, who was his favorite son, remember, to go hunt for him, make his favorite meal, and then he will give Esau the blessing that he needs before his dad dies. The problem is, is that mama overhears this. And since Jacob is her favorite, she hatches up a plan. Now, before you feel bad for Jacob for having a mama who hatched up a plan like this, just know that Jacob is 76 years old, letting his mama still make decisions for him. It's a little late in life to be blaming things on your mom at this point. At some point, you have to take ownership of your life. So she, the mom, tells Jacob to go get a couple of our finest goats. She will cook it. And since your dad is blind because he's so old, he will think it's Esau he's blessing. And we'll trick him, and it'll actually be Jacob. But Jacob thinks, this is so crazy. The Bible's funny. You should really read it. Jacob thinks, but I'm not hairy. Dad's going to lay his hand on me and feel that I'm not hairy and know that it's not Esau, and we're going to be found out. So she says, we'll kill a goat and we'll cover the skin, we'll cover your skin with the hair of the goats to be prepared to trick Isaac even more. And then here's what it says in Genesis 27, verse 15. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son, and the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. So he went to his father and said, my father. And he said, here am I. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. He lied. He said, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, 
The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. They tricked him. They tricked Isaac into blessing Jacob, the secondborn. He stole the blessing. Isaac blessed Jacob. You can get so good at being someone else that even the people closest to you cannot tell the difference anymore. Your spouse, your family, your coworkers, your friends, you can fool them all and they may never tell the difference. But what they weren't counting on was Esau returning so soon. So he's out hunting and when Esau returns and finds out what just happened, he is rightfully angry. And he's been out hunting. I don't know what kind of weapons he had with him. But now he finds out about this when he returns and he wants to kill Jacob. So Jacob has to run. He gets the blessing, but he ends up on the run for 21 years. For 21 years he runs. But here's the deal. God can't bless who we pretend to be. God can't bless who we pretend to be. God can't bless Jacob dressed up like Esau. And I don't know about you, but there are many versions of me. There's the me as I am. There's the me as I want to be. You see, the me I want to be, this me is awesome. This me is kind. He's the best dad in the world. He's the best husband. He's always there for everyone who needs him. This me gets things done. This me is ripped. He's in shape. This guy always has the right words to say. And since I'm not currently this person, I want you to think I'm this person. And I think we all do this. We do all these things and can even be tempted to sacrifice our morals or to cheat the system, to blur the details, to cover things up just so that we can make it look like we still have it all together. But what good is it if we gain the world and gain success but lose our soul? What good is it if you receive the blessing of Isaac if you can't even stay in the house afterwards? What good is it? What good is it if you got what you wanted but you lost your family? Let's get real practical for a minute. What good is it if you have to sacrifice your morals just to get that job? I mean, what good is it if you have to cheat the system to have a little more money? Or a teenager, what what good is it if you have to do things that you know are wrong just to be accepted by that person or that group of people? What good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? So we learn how to get tough and put on a mask and be someone We know we really aren't. You get really good at wearing Esau's clothes, but what good is it? What good is it to fool Isaac when you can't even fool yourself? What good is it to fool everyone else when you know you can't fool God? He got the blessing, but he lost what God wanted him to be. And I think there's someone listening to me today who has the popularity, but you're losing yourself. You've got the possessions and you're doing pretty good, but you are losing yourself. You've got the status and you're pretty well known, maybe even in our community, but you're losing yourself. You are compromising morals that you never imagined you would have. What good is it if you're losing your soul? You see, God can only bless who you really are are, not who we pretend to be. You see, it would take Jacob many more years to figure this out, 21 more years to be exact. So he starts going back home. Maybe he got tired of running, I don't know. Uh, Maybe he got tired of hiding, tired of pretending. So he decided to head back home to potentially make things right. And he knows he's going to have to meet up with Esau, the brother he stole the blessing from. He knows that Esau is still going to be mad about this. But before he meets with Esau, he gets into a very unexpected wrestling match that we read at the very beginning. Um, He gets into this wrestling match with someone that most people believe was some form of Jesus himself, that it was actually Jesus he was wrestling with. But Jacob doesn't really know that in that moment. It's night, and it's dark, and he's tired. And we read the passage about the wrestling at the beginning, and I wonder, when we first read that passage 
How old in your mind were you picturing Jacob to be? A teenager? Just a young 20, 30-year-old guy? But if we do the math, let's think about this for a minute. He was 76 when he stole the blessing. He was on the run for 21 years. That means this guy was 97 years old wrestling with Jesus, wrestling all night long. No wonder his hip went out of socket, right? 97 years old and wrestling. He's old. He's been through some things. He's lost some things in his life. He's seen some things in his life. He's lost people. He's been beat up. He's grabbed at things his entire life. And then in Genesis 32, verse 26, in the middle of this wrestling match, he says this, let me go, or the person he's wrestling with says, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Hear me out very closely. I think you can safely assume that you have found yourself when you hold on to God, even when it seems like it would be easier to let go. Through the pain, keep holding on. Through the loneliness, keep holding on. Through the tears, keep holding on. Jacob, through the uncertainty, kept holding on until he got the blessing. Through the disappointments, through the darkness, he just kept holding on. And sometimes you have to decide once and for all that you are tired of the fakeness, that you are tired of the games you've kept up for so long, that you are sick of pretending, that you are done putting on a mask, and that you will not let go of God. Jacob says, I will not let you go. You see, he's been holding on to heels his entire life, trying to be blessed, but now he's holding on to God. He stopped grabbing heels and grabbed on to the only one who has the power to bless him. And then the next verse, in verse 27, and he said to them, the person he's wrestling with said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. It's weird to me because they've been in the middle of the fight all night, and it's like sometime at the end of this fight, it's like, oh, maybe we should get to know each other and have introductions real quick. Let's stop the fight. You broke my hip. We've been out here all night fighting, and now you want to know my name? But we can't miss the power of this moment. Do you remember the last time in Scripture somebody asked Jacob what his name was? 21 years prior, his dad, blind as can be, says, what is your name? And Jacob says, Esau. You see, 21 years ago when someone asked his name, he lied about who he was, just like he had been lying to himself all his life. Now somebody asks him his name, and he gets another chance. This time when someone asked his name, he said, Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. And I don't know that he said this, but I wonder if this is what he was thinking. I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob the deceiver. I'm Jacob the backstabber. I'm Jacob the fake. I'm Jacob the trickster. I'm Jacob the heel grabber. The one who's always trying to be first. I'm Jacob. Here I am. All of me. I have issues. I have a mess. Things aren't always right in my life, but I am Jacob. I'm not perfect. I've pretended to be someone else for so long, but now I am admitting who I really am. He finally admitted who he really was. And then in the next verse, verse 28, then he said, your name shall be no longer called Jacob, but Israel. So he changes his name to Israel. You see, once Jacob finally admits who he was, God says to him, your name will be Israel which means triumphant with God. So he changes his name in that moment. It was in the struggle that God changes everything for him. And I think I'm talking to some people today who feel like every day is a struggle. You keep thinking you have to be someone else. And if you just fake it till you make it, everything will be better. But I'm here to tell you, don't wait until you're 97 years old to figure out who you really are and who God wants you to be. You know what's crazy to me? As God changes Jacob's name to Israel, it's the new part of Jacob. He says, your name is now Israel. You're 97 years old, but I just changed your name. You see, you're Israel, the part of Jacob that finally realized some things, the part that finally is starting to figure out his life, the better part of Jacob. His name is Israel. It's something to be very, very proud of. But many years later, many, 
God appeared in another form to a man named Moses. You've heard of Moses. We've talked about him in this series. Moses, at the beginning of his life, was just out tending sheep in the wilderness. And God tells Moses, I'm going to use you to free my people. And Moses is like, I can't believe this. I've got concerns. I'm not a good leader. He thinks he's not worthy, and he doesn't know how he's going to do any of it. Moses says, God, I can't do this. I can't do what you're asking me to do. You want me to speak for you? I have a stutter, God. I can't do that. You know what God says to him? He says, Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Israel. He says Jacob. He calls him by his previous name. God introduces himself as this. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I get why he is the God of Abraham. Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was the one who was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. That's Abraham. I get that. I get why he is, claims to be the God of Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. He was the miracle child. He was the one God saved from the altar of sacrifice just in the nick of time. It makes sense that God would be the God of Isaac. But why would he brag about being the God of Jacob, the trickster, the fake, the con artist? That God would be the God of Jacob is shocking to me. Why would God, after already changing his name to Israel, still claim to be the God of Jacob? Why would God associate himself with that questionable character? And why does God choose this time when talking to Moses to introduce himself for the very first time as the God of Jacob? And I don't know, but I think it's because maybe there's a little Jacob in all of us. It's possible that God is saying to Moses and to all of us, I am not just the God of the people who have it all together. I am the God of the people who mess up. I am the God of the bad parts of your life. I am the God of the parts that you want to hide from everyone else. I am big enough to be God over all of that. Moses thought the bad parts of him disqualified him from access to God and to being used by God. And we all know something about ourselves that disqualifies us, don't we? But God is saying this, you are not disqualified because I am the God of Jacob too. I'm the God of stuttering lips. I'm the God of messed up people. I am the God of dropouts. I am the God of people who've been to jail. I am the God of addicts. I am the God of divorced people. I am the God of people who've had abortions. I am the God of people who are fake. I am the God of people who've never liked themselves. I am the God of people who feel in over their heads. I am the God of people with anxiety. I am the God of people who are depressed. I am the God of the parents who've lost a child. I am the God of widows. I am the God of those who have been cheated and overlooked. I am big enough to be God over all of those things in your life. So you don't have to hide them. I wonder if that's what he's saying. See, if God can be God of Jacob, and not only that, but proudly introduce himself as the God of Jacob, then we should understand that he doesn't want us pretending anymore. What about you? Man, don't wait till you're 50, 60, 70, or even 97 years old before you admit who you really are. What good is it to pretend and to gain the whole world but lose your soul? You see, Jesus is greater, and here's what I learned from Jacob. Jesus is greater than my mess. Jesus is greater than my dysfunction, just like he was greater than Jacob's dysfunction. So you walked in today feeling like a major mess up. Well, good news, we all do. We all mess up. You are in very good company in this room, but don't live, leave here still living in your mess. Lay some things down. Hand some things over to Jesus. Share your burdens with us. We want to help. Do work with the Lord over these next few minutes and give yourself completely to him. Stop hiding. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment? I think today, as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and we take just a couple of moments to reflect here, I think today some of us just need to be honest with ourselves. You've pretended to be something for a long time, but Jesus is greater than what you're pretending to be, I promise. And if you're here today and you've never experienced a relationship with Jesus and you've been struggling and striving and fighting, I'm here to tell you Jesus is greater. 
And if you've never met him or never been introduced to him or never had a relationship with him, we would love to introduce you to him today. And in just a moment, we're going to stand and worship with one more song. And this would be a great time for you to maybe kneel where you are and talk to God. Come forward and talk to God. Come pray with me or anybody you'd like to. Just do work with the Lord over these next few minutes because here's the deal. God's not going to bless Cross Community Church if we're just pretending. We have to be real. Because God's not going to bless who we pretend to be. So, Father, as we get serious over these next few moments, God, would you help us to look at our soul? We're, we're so quick to make sure all the exterior looks good. When things go wrong in our life, we make sure our image looks good and make sure that we look like we're holding it together. But, God, help us today to lay all that down to reveal the true us, to understand that you're only going to begin to bless us whenever we get real with you. God, work in our hearts this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. Would you stand quietly right where you are and let's take just a couple of moments to do business with the Lord.